United States Court of Military Appeals. Associate Judges of the United States Court of Military Appeals. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable, the United States Court of Military Appeals is now open and in session. God save the United States of America and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. The court calls the United States versus samples. Uh, the court before beginning the argument, the court would like to state that uh, the uh, waiver on cameras in the courtroom pursuant to our court's rules have been waived for this argument. You may proceed with argument. May it please the court. My name is Lieutenant David Sheldon, and I represent the petitioner in this case. Lieutenant David Samples. With leave of the court, I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. Granted. It has been said that performance alone is worth the whole world of a promise. Well, if that is true, it is so very true of this case. Because the government today comes before this court asking it not to enforce the promise, the agreement, the bond that Commander Monaghan made as a representative of the United States. Those are his, his words, not mine. This court should find that Commander Monaghan's acts as the Assistant Staff Force Judge Advocate for Admiral Reason in prosecuting the tailhook cases amounted to a de facto transactional grant of immunity thus barring the petitioner's court-martial at any time in the future. To do so, this court must establish three things. First of all, whether Commander Monaghan had the apparent authority to act on behalf of Admiral Reason. And it is clear in this case that he did. What tells us that is this court's own opinion in Cook v. Orser. And in that case, this court specifically stated that a staff judge advocate, Brigadier General Teagarden, acting on behalf of the commanding officer, granted de facto transactional immunity. That should close the discussion today of whether Commander Monaghan, in this case, who, he, who by his own admission was the assistant staff force judge advocate, who was coordinating prosecutions in this case, who was coordinating immunity alone, as he himself states on the record, that should close the discussion. The, the facts of this case alone, as far as establishing that Commander Monaghan was the Assistant Staff Force Judge Advocate, established that he had the apparent authority. He was clothed in the apparent authority to grant immunity in this case. Counsel, can I interrupt you for a moment? Isn't there a little difference, though, between the status of the Staff Judge Advocate in Cook v. Orser and the Staff Judge Advocate here? In, the, in Cook v. Orser, as I remember the facts, uh, he was just talking verbally about a grant of immunity. In this, in this situation, Commander Monaghan had a written grant of immunity which was signed by Admiral Reeser. Wasn't, wasn't that, that, that the fact? That, that's correct as stated, Your Honor. It's also important to note that he effectuates that grant of immunity by signing or rather dating the uh, immunity itself. It's also important today to distinguish that we're not talking about the piece of paper that Admiral Reeser had signed. 
we're talking about the representations of Commander Monaghan that the petitioner in this case would not be prosecuted if he cooperated with the tail hook investigation and told all that he knew. That's the grant of immunity that we're talking about. And it was affirmed by two separate agents of the United States afterwards, Lieutenant Commander Ritter and Agent Sawinski. And in that regard, this is critical, that, that, agent, that, that Commander Monaghan's representation, not the piece of paper that Admiral Reason had signed, but the representation that went beyond that, that established de facto grant of transactional immunity, that's what we're concerned with. Do you have any authority for the grant of a de facto immunity being affected after the submission of a written grant of immunity? Well, Your Honor, there is. In uh, United States versus Harvey, the, the 11th Circuit specifically acknowledges that prosecutors can make an informal grant of transactional immunity beyond, they, they of course cannot give uh, testimony, they, they cannot give a written grant of transactional immunity only by statute, similar to the Navy and the Marine Corps today, can they give testimonial immunity. In that regard, there is authority to support that a prosecutor can go beyond that. What's important here is the acts of Commander Monaghan himself in how he represents, as this court recognized in Cook v. Orser. That's the decision point today, Cook v. Orser, where this court recognized that a staff judge advocate must act with all due integrity. He is the person who's representing the interests of the United States. An accused must gamble on much, but he need not gamble on the integrity of the individual. What, what effect should we give the understanding of the accused about what was said to him? I mean, uh, it, unless, I'm, unless somebody made up this testimony, it said, Commander Monaghan, never told you that you couldn't be prosecuted for anything that might have happened at Tailhook if evidence came from some other source, did he? Answer, no, he did not. Uh, another question, but your impression clearly was then that Commander Monaghan explained the documents to you to mean that anything you said to investigators or anyone else under your grant couldn't be used against you unless, as you said, the conditions of perjury or false statements might be met. Answer unless I didn't tell the truth. That's correct, sir. It looks to me like it's clear that your client understood that he was required to tell the truth, and if he did tell the truth, uh, that was the end of the matter. Now we have allegations he did not tell the truth. Isn't that what this trial is all about? You have a, you have a new witness that says your client did not tell the truth. I, I, I think in that regard, you're, you're exactly right, Your Honor. I think what, what is taken away from this is one in terms of what Commander Monaghan represented to the accused. Remember, there's only two people in that room when but, Commander Monaghan... But Monahan we should at least require the accused to be coming forward and said, I was given a transactional immunity. He, not, he, he, not, he, he didn't seem to understand it that way. I, I, I think what he didn't understand is the state of the law. And there's two people in that room on that day. One of them is the lawyer. And he's the one that should be. And that's what this court's decision in Cook v. Orser stated, that... Uh, he's the one that's responsible for, cl for clarifying that. The lay person who's sitting there, and he has to consider testimonial, transactional, immunity, event, use. It is very confusing. And it's admitted on the record that, and you pointed to those places where he says representations that uh, he, he only had use immunity. But what's important to take away from that is that there are at least five other places on the record where he states, yes, I was given transactional immunity. Does he say transactional immunity? No. What does he say? That the government wouldn't prosecute me if I simply told the truth. Later on, this is, of course, confirmed by two separate agents. To, uh, Agent Sawinski, and that, that's stated on, actually, Lieutenant Commander Ritter is on page 205 of the record, and on uh, page 177, I believe it is, uh, where Lieutenant Sawinski, uh, or rather, Agent Walensky, I, I'm pronouncing that wrong, Agent Walensky stated on the record that, yes, he, in fact, uh, did make that representation. He confirmed it. 
That's what's critical, is what's taken away. <coughs> and the accused, when he, he's asked, and I think it's important, he's not asked by a civilian defense counsel, he's asked by the military judge, confronted by the military judge, what was your impression when you left that room? My impression was that if I told the truth, I would not be prosecuted. Well, isn't this trial all about whether he told the truth? That, in essence... I mean, this, this, uh, a witness came forth, as I understand from your pleadings, a witness came forth the day after he was interviewed by the special agents. June the 3rd was when your man gave statements, right? Y yes, Your Honor. And the, the other lieutenant came forward on June the 5th? Yes, Your Honor. And said, Samples was there and pulled down the young woman's pants. He is the one that did that. And Samples had already given statements to Admiral Reason and to the NIS that he was there, but that he did not assault her or did not touch her. Now, we now have a serious conflict between two statements. That, now, that's correct. It seems to me that that fits exactly. I'll quote your client. I felt that. As long as I told the truth to anyone that asked me any questions about Tailhook 91, that I would not be prosecuted. This case is about whether he was telling the truth. And, and it's very clear that it, it's not established whether he was telling the truth or not after the fact. But how do we, we establish it if we can't have a trial, if, but, he's, if he's given transactional immunity as to whether or not he was telling the truth? He can be, he can be of course, prosecuted under other articles for making false statements to uh, <laughs> the investigators or for making false swearing. I don't believe that under the state of the law, that he can be prosecuted for tra for the events which occurred on the third floor of the Hilton Hotel. And I think the, the authority which stands for that proposition is United States versus Harvey. And we've cited it in our brief, the 11th Circuit case. Specifically in that case, what was challenged was whether you could uh, subsequent effect events which were misconduct, uh, filing of false tax claims in that case, could be at issue, and it wasn't barred under the transactional grant of immunity. And the court specifically looked in footnote 8 of its pleading that there is not a question in that regard on the issue of veracity after the fact, only to the events that occurred after the fact, not to the substance. And indeed, what has to happen here is the, uh, and, and the real, uh, your, your Honor's fundamental question is, when he comes forward and he makes these representations, what was the quality of those representations? What, were the, what was their effects? Did he say, did I remember, did I recall, et cetera? If he doesn't remember, if he cooperates that much, if he says he doesn't recall who he saw, is that in effect not cooperating? The defense admits today that it in fact is. We, Lieutenant Samples has done absolutely everything that he has been required to under the bargain that was struck between Commander Monaghan and him. When the yeah, listen, uh, something that's bothering me about the uh, fairness of this whole procedure, and I think it would be helpful to go through uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the factual, unconverted uh, facts uh, on two June. Uh, your client was down at, uh, where was this take place, Norfolk? Or? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And he's told about the possibility of, of, of a mast, a non-judicial punishment. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. Uh, the people uh, in the Navy know that he has an attorney, Lieutenant Keck here. Keck, Keck, Your Honor. Okay. Then on 3 June, they call him in and say, we're going to give you a mast. So he goes to mast which is a, you know, I mean, that's a serious thing, but it's non-judicial punishment. Yes, Your Honor. And then immediately thereafter, doesn't he come out and goes to uh, Monaghan's office where he's handed a piece of paper? Did, does Monaghan date that? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe, he, at least on, uh, on the record at... You know, and, and, you know, here he's just gone, he's just met with, was it three-star or two-star admiral? Yes, Your Honor. Prior to that, if I can clarify, Captain Williams met with him. Captain Williams tells him, I don't care what Admiral Reason just said. I think you're guilty of that assault. And what that tells us, and, and by clarification, Captain Williams is Commander Monaghan's boss. 
he's the force judge advocate. He says, I don't care. I think you're guilty of that. What that tells you is the government knows full well what's going on. They suspect the petitioner of a crime, in this case, the crime of indecent assault. Then they turn around and they give him a testimonial grant of immunity. I mean, they date it right in front of him, don't they? That's correct, Your Honor. And then they say, here's your immunity, and they, and they, uh, and here's, you know, this, this young aviator is, you know, you just had met a three star and, and some captain says, you know, you know, you're guilty or, you know, you know, and so then he goes in and sees a commander. He gives him this. He says, report. And then doesn't he go right to the first interrogation? That, that's actually, I believe that's correct, Your Honor. It's either that day or the following day. There was a lapse there, but certainly there was no counsel advice. And certainly there, uh, and the government, of course, knew that, but uh, they didn't come within and, and request counsel be present. Counsel, was, was, was Lieutenant Samples free to... Um not enter into the immunity agreement? Now, maybe I shouldn't even call it an agreement. That presupposes the answer. Was, was he free to reject the testimonial immunity? I, I don't believe so under the state of the law, ma'am. I, uh, once you waive your testimonial, or, or once the government waives that, you, you cannot invoke a Fifth Amendment privilege. I direct your Honor's attention to the concurrent, or actually the, the opinion of uh, Judge Clark in the Harvey case, I think it, it, it's a 1989 case, it explains the further scope that's entailed within the uh, Fifth Amendment privilege as it applies to transactional immunity. It's important to note that it's a further scope. And why do prosecutors want to grant that? So that they can get more out of, uh, make, the, make the individual feel as if they're more comfortable. Again, these, sta th these nuances of law are lost upon the petitioner. I think that goes to Judge Cox's point when, Your Honor, you stated he didn't really know what was happening. Well, but he, he knew. <laughs> I, I, he might not have understood the law, and, and uh, I'm not so sure I do either. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm sympathetic with your client in that regard. But one thing he seemed to really know was he only had whatever protection he had. He only had it if he was truthful. That's correct, Your Honor. Now, the allegation is that he was not truthful. But the, the allegation uh, is... Because he told Admiral Reason at Mast, if I understand the facts, sir, I did not assault anyone. The, the, not, the and, question, and the Admiral set that aside, found him. The, 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 the question as far as Admiral Reason is outside of the scope of this appeal. That's not at issue. What is at issue is what occurs after Commander Monaghan tells him. And if the government can prove in that regard that the petitioner breached his government or his agreement, we can go down that path eventually. They haven't done that today. Again, Again, I want to stress your. your well, honor. I understand what, you, what I understand your your argument, but I, I don't think you're even conceding that they could uh, that the government could prosecute him for perjury, N no, arising yeah. out of this uh, yeah. what he said prior to the grants of immunity or any false statements or anything else. I I, I don't concede that, Your yeah. Honor. But uh, I'm I'm just curious in my mind. If the next day, instead of this lieutenant coming in and saying, if, if somebody had come in and said, gee, I was at the convention and here's a videotape I took. I didn't realize you guys were all interested. Here's a videotape and it showed him committing the offense. You claim he's got immunity it from it. It sounds like to me what Your Honor is stating is by the terms of the agreement that the government made a bad agreement. No, no, I'm not. I think the government made a testimonial immunity. And, and I think Monaghan said, look, if you're truthful, this is going to be the end of this matter. Well, you, Your Honor, it, it, I, I, And I think he was, that, that's part of the agreement. It, it's not testimonial to say you're not going to be prosecuted if it, you're truthful. That's not testimonial immunity. That's nothing. That, what that is, <laughs> is that's a de facto grant of immunity under Chernovic, under uh, Kimball, and under Cunningham versus Gilovich. They suspect him of a crime. They make a representation. The person who's the lawyer for a GCM authority, unlike United States versus, uh, or rather Cunningham versus Gilovich, makes a representation that as long as you're truthful, we're not going to prosecute you. All, as long as you cooperate with us, we're not going to prosecute you. What's the government looking for in this case? What they're simply looking for is the bigger fish in the pond. 
they're looking to go after Commander Tritt and Commander Miller. And they didn't get that. They're dissatisfied with the result. Perhaps, and, and, and to petitioner's credit, he has not changed his story throughout this event. He is still maintained, he doesn't recall, he doesn't know, and to that extent, that is supported by the record. And he, excuse me, but didn't he say initially that he wasn't even at the gauntlet? And then uh, another lieutenant came forward, and then he admitted he was at the gauntlet? He, he states that, and, and he, he was also, and, and I can clarify that for your honor, <coughs> when he tells Agent Walensky after the fact, he says, I lied about that. And he's very candid. He accepts that he lied about that. And, and that just demonstrates the cooperation that Petitioner gave in this case. He admitted to <coughs> lying to other investigators in this case. And it's untenable for the government to suggest... Now, now, uh, uh, to my brothers, uh, the questions in there uh, seem to focus on the truthfulness of your client. Uh, but is that not... Is it irrelevant because uh, what if in a hypothetical, I give you immunity. You know, I, I, I know you committed a crime. I know you, com you murdered your wife. I don't know if you're married or not, but uh, I know you murdered someone, but I can't prove it. And finally, I'm at my, I'm the prosecutor, and I say, okay, here's immunity. And if you, if you tell me the truth, you're never going to be prosecuted. And say, now, did you kill your wife? And you say, no, I never killed my wife. And it seems to me that immunity is given for murder, but if I can prove later on that you lied by, by proving the murder, then I can, the only crime I can prosecute you for under these circumstances is for perjury. That, that, that's exactly correct, Your Honor. And that answers Your, your Honor's question, Judge Cox, and Judge Gerke's question. It, that, does, it doesn't answer mine because that's not what your client understood that he had. I, I, I don't think so. On, on well, show, you show me in the record where he said it. On page 222 of the record, he says, if I tell the truth, I won't be prosecuted. There's, there, well, there's several. And that's what I'm, uh, the government's alleging he didn't tell the truth, so now they're prosecuting. And, and they, they, can, they, they can prosecute they him. They just can't use any evidence that he is No, Your Honor, that's not correct. It. That, that it, it says, as what Chief Judge Sullivan stated, you cannot hold the person once you give transactional immunity. Again, the government's... But, but see, Monaghan did not have authority to give transactional immunity. You've got to come up with some type of, some type of uh, de facto or something like... Exactly, in, Your Honor. Cunningham, I think uh, you cited Cunningham. I, my recollection of that case is that we did not find de facto immunity there. That, that's correct, and why didn't you, Your Honor? Because, because the guy didn't have authority Colonel, to do that? Colonel Naylor was a special court martial convening authority. It's analogous. This case is not analogous to Cunningham. It's analogous to Cook v. Orser, where the staff judge advocate in Cook v. Orser gave immunity, transactional de facto grant of immunity in, w with regard to the petitioner in that case. That's what it's analogous. And it was relied upon because why? He's representing the United States. He's representing the commanding officer who is a general court martial convening authority. We even have a better case here in the Admiral Reason is a consolidated disposition authority for all tail hook cases. He's the one person. And he on the record states at page 30, I was coordinating with my staff judge advocates on a regular basis. It's not testimonial immunity. It's transactional uh, immunity. Let me, I'm sorry. let me ask you a question about uh, the analogy or the uh, comparison to Cook versus Orser. In Cook versus Orser, we, first of all, are we in agreement that his belief that he's been granted transactional immunity must be a reasonable and honest one? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And that's why in, uh, it failed perhaps in, in Cunningham because he was a special court-martial convening authority. It wasn't reasonable for him to believe that he could grant immunity in a case that obviously would go to a general court-martial. That's correct. In Cook versus Orso, we have a second lieutenant who's reasonably believing that a brigadier general has granted him uh, transactional immunity. And the brigadier general is the staff judge advocate for the Strategic Air Command. In this case, we have a, an O3 uh, Navy lieutenant who is, who has to be tested as to his reasonable belief that a commander, an 05, who is not the staff judge advocate, but an assistant staff judge advocate, 
has the same power or uh, that uh, uh, General Teagarden had in the Cook versus Orser case. Now, your Honor, I, uh, isn't there a difference there? N no, Your Honor. I, I, I base it upon the record. At page 109 of the record, he represents, he, Commander Monaghan, represents himself as us, common, the United States of America. I'm giving immunity. He tells the petitioner in this case that in 15 cases, other officer cases, he gave immunity. He states to them also that uh, he told the judge, the judge in this case, at page 122 and 123 of the record, he was the only individual handling immunity for Admiral Re Reason. He concedes at page 117 of the record that until the testimonial immunity, the actual document which is signed, is given, it's not effective. That also is recognized and counseled by the fact that, of course, in the federal prosecutors, federal prosecutors can go beyond, just as this court recognized in Cook v. Orser, that tr informal grants of transactional immunity can occur. And that's what occurred in this case. Was it reasonable to assume that after you go from the admiral, as your honor, Chief Judge Sullivan, you noted, to Captain Williams being told, I know you're lying. I know that you assaulted that person. To Commander Monaghan, who said, here's the olive branch. It's reasonable for him to assume that that line of succession is direct. In fact, Admiral Reason himself testified as much when he says on pages... You know, this, while you look that up, but the dating of it by Monaghan in front of your client sort of lends an aura of authority to the, the whole process. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, okay, here we are. And, you know, I mean, it's like I got the power to sign this and date it or not, or, you know, even though it's signed by Reeser, right? Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. And again, I, uh, to, to give you a cite on the 60, page 60 of the record, after mask quotations, immunity, the different types of immunity were explained. I wish to fill in some of the holes. Uh, specifically at 59, whether any immunity was given. Note that Admiral Reason is leaving it open whether there was transactional or testimonial. Your Honor, I think that supports Your Honor's question with regard to whether Commander Monaghan is bolstered in this case to a Cook v. Orser sense. And Your Honor, specifically, I think you're drawing on, on a critical distinction in this case, and that is who's the lawyer in the room? Line officers are fearful of lawyers because they can talk out of two sides of their mouth. That's what happened in this case. Let's not understate the evasive, the coy testimony of Commander Monaghan on the record. At one point, he was reprimanded by the judge on the record. That's critical. The responsibility in this case lies in the government. They drew the promise that was the bargain for this agreement. If the petitioner was truthful, he would not be court-martialed. Your Honor correctly noted, and Judge Cox, this is critical that we, that, that the court understands this. If he wasn't truthful, then he can be per perhaps if the government can prove that, court-martialed for different offenses. But he's given immunity under transactional grant for that. I, I think you're making an excellent argument, as you always do. Uh, Thank you. But if we want to construe this agreement not from the two sides of a lawyer's mouth, but from the person who wants us to enforce it, okay? It, the last thing that was asked, I, I felt just that, that as long as I told the truth to anyone that asked me any questions about Tailhook 91, I would not be prosecuted. And when you discussed it with Lieutenant Commander Ritter, what was your belief? Exactly the same thing. I mean, his belief is, if he's truthful, he would not be prosecuted. Now, there's a witness out there that says he's not truthful. And how do we ever test that if you can't be prosecuted? Uh, you, you, it doesn't you, say anything about that I will only be prosecuted for perjury if I don't tell you. It's a, it's, it well, Your Honor, I think that's obviously the petitioner in this case. I, I don't think... Uh, if he had, Your Honor, uh, admitted on the stand to doing X, Y, and Z, at Tailhook. They could not use it against him under testimonial immunity. Your Honor, I'd go further because they said, we will not prosecute you. He specifically says that. Agent Walensky says that. 
Yes, that's correct. You won't be prosecuted if you cooperate with us, if you tell us the truth. The government wanted Commander Miller in this case. They wanted Commander Tritt. They didn't well, get I, that. I understand that, but my point is, well, oh. we, we have, I, your time's up. I apologize. Can I ask this one? Because I'm having trouble with this. If they, he can't be prosecuted, he's, he's given the immunity, arguably, as long as he tells the truth. If he did not tell the truth, then wh what does the government do about that? I've understood you to say he couldn't be prosecuted for the assault because he was given transactional immunity. I've also understood you at one point to say he couldn't be prosecuted for the perjury. Your Honor, I'd venture to say that Chief Judge Sullivan answered that question when he could be prosecuted for statements that he made to the DCIS after the investigation. And that's what the Harvey case specifically states okay. in uh, its analysis on this issue. And I direct the court to footnote eight of its opinion, the 11 circuits. So that your position is that the perjury charge could lie? There, there is no perjury charge before the court today, but of I course the government... I understand that. Yes, Your Honor. I understand. Okay. You're trying not to concede that your client may or may not have perjured himself. Uh, and, and to his credit, Your Honor, yeah. he's never wavered from this story through his, his version of the truth. The, uh, and uh, admittedly, there's 300 people on the floor of Tailhook Convention at, on the third floor. He's never wavered. So the fact that the government represents him as somebody who's untruthful, quite the contrary, quite the contrary. On the record, he is forthright. On the record, he states inconsistencies, but he's forthright. He says, when I left that room, I didn't believe I would be prosecuted if I cooperated with the authorities. Contra that with Commander Monaghan's statements, which are evasive, which are coy and misleading. The one lawyer in the room was Commander Monaghan. He's representing the interests of the United States, and Cook the Orser controls. So you, you just made the statement that that, that I'm wrapped around so badly. Say it again. He, could, he understood that he could not be prosecuted if he cooperated. Is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. And the government is saying he didn't cooperate. He, he lied. He came before. He, he came and before. So under your own construction, he, ipso facto, he can now be prosecuted if the government can prove he didn't cooperate, that, that he lied. And, and, and the question is, and it goes to Judge Gerke's uh, question as well, what can he be prosecuted for? Not the indecent what assault. What did he think he could be prosecuted for? What the law says he can be for, prosecuted for. For what happened at Tailhook 91. No, Your Honor. Well, reading his words. No, Your Honor. I, the, the record doesn't support that. Okay. Well, Counsel, what he can be prosecuted for depends on whether or not he had transactional immunity, de facto, as you would, would contend, or whether he had a grant of testimonial immunity. Correct, Your Honor. And there is a difference. Oh, of, of course. And we're not contending that there isn't, but we're all, we are contending that it's uh, supported by the record. And in fact, the military judge below found this, is that he had told him that he would not be prosecuted if he cooperated well, so with see, the authorities. Where, that's where you and I are having a uh, communications problem. I'm assuming there was transactional immunity. Right, Your Honor. For anything he did at Tailhook 91. Correct. The condition of that transactional immunity for anything he did at Tailhook 91 is that he cooperates. Right, and he now, showed up. The government is now saying he violated that. He didn't cooperate because we now prove that the stuff he's telling us is false. I mean, they're not, that's what the, the effect of this is. But the question is, is when he shows up at uh, the subsequent investigations, he's cooperating. He's telling them. He, he shows up on he's two He's telling them occasions. something, but the government's contending that's not truthful. And it's again, not you would have You're not to cooperating by giving a lie, are you? Right, Your Honor. Insofar as perhaps the accused, and, and again, this is all theoretical in the sense that if the accused, uh, it, it, there's absolute proof on the record that he was at tail hook, that he was on the third floor, would that uh, circumvent uh, the agreement not to prosecute him for that uh, effects or for those events. No, it would not. He could still be prosecuted for if the government could prove that he lied. If he, the government what, could what prove that he lied. What if he said, I've got lied. this immunity, uh, and, and uh, the, the NIS said, well, show up at 3 o'clock to give a statement. He says, no, I'm not going to cooperate with that. I'll be there at 5. Is that non-cooperation? Would that violate the agreement? Well, again, you, you would look as your federal circuit courts, your sisters and brother federal circuit courts look to, and that is what is 
a reasonable performance of the obligation. Mm -hmm. And a reasonable performance of the obligation was completed here. He showed up, he provided his version of the truth. If the government wants to contend that he was lying, then they can find out and they can prosecute him for lying, but not for the indecent assault which allegedly he committed at Tailhook 91. Not to put too fine a point on this, but I think, I think it is a, a matter of concern for this court as, as seen by several questions in this area, but your client stands accused of assault only. He doesn't stand accused of perjury. That's correct. Or giving a false statement. So that, in that essence, sort of means that uh, the government could not prove perjury or a false statement. It, it, exactly. Not, and not that that's a, a, you know, it's an inference. Uh, and so that sort of cuts against the, the cooperation that, you know, we know you're lying. Uh, exactly. And remember, he was giving an orders violation to, then, uh, to, to cooperate, which he then did. It, he could be guilty of a violation of an order if he didn't cooperate. The bottom line is, and, and this, Your Honor, goes to Judge uh, Crawford, your distinction on testimonial vice transactional. It is clear that in this circumstance, and there is a soliloquy on uh, page 101 of the Cunningham opinion, where Chief Judge, or rather Judge Gerke, you wrote out and contrast Cook, Chernovic, and Kimball from Cunningham. And the defense submits very clearly that this case falls in the cunning, or rather the Cook, Chernobyl, Kimball line of cases. The petitioner in this case, the government knew he was a suspect. In fact, they had just told him he was a suspect. They told him that they didn't believe that he was uh, telling the truth to Admiral Reason. They had a statement six months before that said, we don't believe uh, that that's implicated him in the indecent assault. He is a general court-martial convening authority in his representation. That's what this court's decision in Cook v. Orser said. And the basis of the decision is that fairness. We will not allow for staff judge advocates to behave in misconduct in, in, tis, in trying to get something in the pretrial negotiation stage. This court wouldn't tolerate it in Cook v. Orser. It shouldn't tolerate it today. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, just very quickly, uh, to make sure that I understand your position. I know your time is up. Do you, do, you, do you concede that the written document that was given to the defendant uh, provided for uh, testimonial immunity? Y your Honor, y y yes. Y so, okay. It, it definitely provides. There's no, no dispute about that in your no, mind. Your you, you concede that that document provided and, for testimonial immunity. And that's immunity. not an issue in but, this. Well, well, wait a minute. So you concede that that, that, yes, that document, it, that it written document states, that was signed by the Admiral, uh, Admiral Reeser, yes, uh, provided testimonial immunity. Yes, Your Honor. Your position is, is that document was superseded by the comments that were made by uh, Commander Monaghan. Yes, is that right? Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. So an oral, essentially an oral commentary uh, supersedes a written document. Precisely, and that's consistent with uh, case law in this area. Uh, see de facto grants of immunity given in Cook, Chernovic, and Kimball. There was no written testimonial uh, immunity grant that, your, was, uh, that existed in uh, uh, Cook, Kimball, and Chernovic. That's correct, Your Honor. Insofar as he can go beyond that, just as in United States versus Harvey, federal prosecutors can go beyond an agreement. And again, I, I think that we can't underestimate the deception which may have occurred on the record in this case. When Commander Monaghan testifies on the stand, he is at best coy and unconvincing. And in this case, he confuses the petitioner and tells him, no, you have transactional immunity. That's a fact made by the trial judge below. This court should find that he has transactional immunity. However, the trial judge did hold that, that Commander Monaghan did not advise him and that he understood that he, had, uh, that he didn't have transactional immunity. Well, Your Honor, the, uh, the conclusion of law which he reaches is that but it's not supported by the facts in the record. And petitioner was promised by Commander Monaghan, which was then ratified subsequently by two 
officers of the United States, Agent Walensky and Lieutenant Commander Ritter, that stated specifically, if you don't testify, or rather, if you cooperate with us, we will not prosecute. It is unequivocal. It ratifies the exact agreement which Commander Monaghan told the accused, and the accused himself acknowledged on the record, I left that room thinking, if I went there, told them what I know, I would not be prosecuted for the offenses. He went to the, the Lieutenant Commander Ritter, he went to Agent Walensky, he stated what he knows, and now the government wants to renege on that promise well, again. What it, this, to try to put this in, a, in my frame of reference that I'm having a little trouble with, I guess, let's assume, arguendo, that Admiral Reason sat down and in his own handwriting said, I hereby give you transactional immunity for anything you may have done at Tailhook, 91. The condition of this immunity is that you cooperate with the authorities, period. Sign, Admiral Reason. Do you understand it? Yes, sir, I do. Do you understand you have transactional immunity? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Now, the next day, the government learns from independent sources that he is not cooperating. He is lying. That's the government's position. Now, un in the government's view of things, he has breached his agreement. He's breached the terms of the transactional immunity. See, I'm not worried about who gave it. He's breached the terms of the transactional right, immunity. Right. Now, as I understand you, that's tough. That's correct, Your Honor. Well, I don't believe that's the law. I, I, I think, Your Honor, it uh, he's, is the if, law. He, if he's got immunity, if, if, it's conditioned upon his cooperation. If he's not cooperating, he loses that transactional immunity. It, Granted, it, under my view in Kimball, the government can't use any evidence that they develop during the course of their conversations and so forth with him. But where you have outside independent evidence which proves beyond a reasonable doubt that he is not cooperating, he has breached his agreement. And he can be prosecuted for, for the underlying offense. No, Your Honor. I don't think that's well. supported by Cunningham. If you act... <laughs> well, then, then you can't... Once you give transactional immunity, then under your theory... It's unconditional. That's correct. And if the and individual, think, uh, if the individual came forward and testified that yes, I was there, I, uh, I, if you, if it was a murder case, I killed the person, and the government subsequently decides to prosecute him, they can't do that as well. I would if agree. he says I don't remember whether I killed the person or not, they can't prosecute. Well, let me give you the classic uh, transactional immunity that I'm familiar with. Uh, an accomplice would be given immunity to come in, transactional immunity to come in and testify truthfully against his accomplice. And he gets to the courthouse and he comes in and he says, I refuse to testify in this case, Your Honor, because I'm afraid I'll be killed. He has breached his, he no longer has transactional immunity. He has not lived up to his end of the bargain. For, for your client to have transactional immunity, he has to live up to his end of the bargain. I think the answer and you, is... And you're just saying he has. In, 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 I and, think and he has, says, Your Honor. And, and, and there's been no variation on my client. He's yeah, but been, the government is contending that he is not. Well, now, the government, Your Honor, should not have... They, they can bring a charge against him asserting perjury. They can have him court-martialed on that. They can prove up its case. Okay, then and, once they prove that he perjured himself, then for sure they've proved he didn't cooperate. Now then they can... Now they can... After that, they can do the assault, right? Uh, no, Your Honor. <laughs> I, I don't think under Chief Judge okay. Sullivan's representations and under my own, the, and, and the, the state of the law in this case, and I'd point, Your Honor, to the 11th Circuit, to the... Uh, the I'm going to read it, don't worry. The grant of immunity only had one condition in it, the, the written grant. Yes, Your Honor. And it wasn't truthfulness. It was to cooperate, I believe, Your Honor. It says it, it, uh, this blah, 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 immunity is effective only upon the condition that you testify under oath as a witness for the government. That's the only condition. Okay. But I, I see Judge Cox's point in that, you know, going from the written, the real issue here is when you have a written document, can oral representation by people, powerful people in the government, bounce that, that thing up to a higher plane of immunity? Certainly, Your Honor. And, and, uh, and, and Judge Cox's, I believe I have this, you know, is that when you go into that oral grant of immunity, uh, there Monaghan put a, uh, a condition, just like Admiral, the Admiral did on his, and his condition was to tell the truth.
Well, to cooperate. But, but no one has proved that your client is lying yet. Precisely, Your Honor. And and down the line, if the government would uh, would like this court to come forward, or rather, would like to come forward at a court martial and prove again, the petitioner needs to come forward, testify, establish those facts, and establish whether he was lying or not. None of that has happened. The government wants to singularly repudiate the contract that it made with the petitioner in this case. That oral argument, that oral contract was based upon Commander Monaghan, a lawyer, a person who's schooled in the understandings of what the law is. And we know, everyone knows, that tailhook is a major the absolute most important case that the Navy is facing today. The representations that he made bind the government. Those representations supersede the written contract in this case, and this court should find transactional immunity. If the government would like to prosecute the petitioner in this case for perjury down the line, so be it. If that repudiates the contract, assuming that they can prove up its case, so be it, then that can be dealt with. But at this stage of the proceedings, it is not allowable under the state of the law. Counsel, what standard of review do we apply to the findings of the military judge? I, I think, Your Honor, a clearly erroneous the, standard. Sorry, Your Would Honor. Would it be a clearly erroneous standard? I, I, I think that under the, uh, uh, and I tried to read Cook v. Orser in terms of establishing what the court looked to. They adopted those findings of fact and found as a matter of law that they constituted a, a, a constituted transactional grant of immunity. In that regard, they're looking at a de novo standard, looking at all of the facts and elevating them and saying, well, as a matter of law, what does this uh, amount to? And it goes to the question of whether it is a finding of uh, fact or a conclusion of law. Venture to say, Your Honor, that it's a question of both. A mixed question. Of yes, Your Honor. Just one quick question. In, uh, in this case, the military judge didn't decide the issue of law as to whether or not there was a grant of immunity. It, it decided the issue of fact of what the defendant understood the conversation with Monaghan to be. And, and, and with re that regard, it would seem that it's not supported in the record because the petitioner is specifically asked by Captain Vest, the military judge, what was your impression when you left the room? My impression was that I would not be prosecuted if I cooperated. That's ratified by Agent w Walensky and Lieutenant uh, Commander Ritter. Now, now the there's no question, Counsel, but that, that comments of that nature are in the record. However, you will admit that there are comments that are inconsistent with that y y yes, in sure. the record that your client made. Like, for example, you read one on 222. On 221, he says, it was my understanding whatever I said wouldn't be used to prosecute me. Whatever I said wouldn't be used to prosecute me. He didn't say I wouldn't be prosecuted. And again, Your Honor, if I, can, uh, if I can respond to that, I think that emphasizes the nature of the relationship of the parties in this case. The petitioner is an aviator, line officer. He's not a lawyer. He's been told event, use, transactional, testimonial, perjury. He says, you can use this, but you can't use it against me. You, have, you don't have to worry about being uh, court-martialed if you tell the truth. Then he said, and I think this goes to exactly what Commander Monaghan was representing, is if down the line we find out you're, you're lying to us, we can hold you accountable for perjury. So we can, in a sense, use those. So I think it highlights the distinction in this case between lawyer and line officer. And who's responsible in that case? Cook B. Orser says the staff judge advocate, the person who's representing the United States of America, is the person who's responsible. And that's what this court should find. Realize that's your position. All right. I think we understand your position. Uh, we'll now hear from the government and we'll give you some time for rebuttal. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Lieutenant Commander O'Claire, arguing on behalf of the government. <clears throat> Since the facts are so important in this case, the government would offer the following brief summary. First, Lieutenant Geis, in January of 1993, made statements to a Defense Criminal Investigative Service agents where he implicated the petitioner in that he said the petitioner was involved with assaults on the third floor of the Hilton Hotel at the Tailhook Symposium and indeed assaulted, uh, assaulted women. Now, Geis is an aviator who was on the third floor. 
he was he's making these statements after he is given transactional immunity no you're on he's making these statements uh, after he's given testimonial immunity oh testimony okay and uh, one of the statements he made is that petitioner did indeed uh, was involved in the gauntlet activity and assaulted women however he stated as to the assault on Julia Rogers, which is the charge uh, before the... Uh, That's the 17-year-old... Correct, Your Honor, 17-year-old right. woman that um, uh, was, was um, a stripped of her clothing below the waist involved in assault. He specifically said that he could not remember who else was involved in that. Although he placed Petitioner in the area, he did not say that Petitioner was involved in that assault. Uh, subsequent to uh, the uh, interview of Lieutenant Geis, the defense criminal investigative service agents came back and interviewed Petitioner, who they interviewed earlier. Petitioner stated that despite what he said earlier, he was on the third floor. However, he denied ever seeing any assaults, and he specifically denied ever assaulting Julia Rogers. Based on Lieutenant Geis's statement, a Petitioner went to Admiral's Mass before Vice Admiral Reason, who was the Navy's Consolidated Disposition Authority for Tailhook Matters. Vice Admiral Reason found that Petitioner made false official statements in the fact that he had lied to investigators saying that he didn't say any assaulted behavior. However, uh, the Admiral specifically found that the accused was not involved or had any knowledge of the assault on Julia Rogers and also specifically found that the accused had not committed an assault. How long did this mass take and was, what was the punishment, if any, given at the end of the mass? Uh, the mass occurred on uh, the 2nd of June, Your Honor. Uh, I'm not sure of the actual length of it. Uh, there was punishment imposed. Um, there was a uh, punitive Restrictions? Uh, no restriction, Your Honor. A punitive letter and a fine. And, um, so so he, he goes up and, and, and has this mass, and, and, he's, and he's given some punishment. That's correct, Your Honor. And then he's uh, shunted. Now explain uh, the, the assembly line of where he wound up giving statement. Yes, Your Honor. What happened after mass was that uh, the petition was given his post-mass rights by uh, Captain Williams, who was the uh, staff chief advocate for uh, Admiral Reason. After that, uh, as part of a prearranged agreement with the Defense Crew Investigative Service, there was this assembly line, if you will, granting of testimony immunity, where Vice Admiral Reason agreed to grant testimony immunity to individuals who had been to mass. The hope, of course, was that armed with this grant of immunity, the individuals would then relay everything that they knew about Tailhook, and then they could use that information against other individuals. <laughs> that grant of testimony immunity was signed by Vice Admiral Reason. It specifically stated that the immunity was given only to use of statements made by the petitioner. This grant of immunity was explained by Commander Monaghan, who was the assistant uh, staff judge advocate. Looking now to the findings by the stop right there before. Yes, sir. What is the authority of Admiral Reason or anyone in the Navy to grant testimonial immunity? That is rule for Court Martial 704, Your Honor. Well, where, where did the authority and rules for Court Martial 704 come from? It came from the President, Your Honor. Well, where did the President get his authority to do that? Delegated from Congress, Your Honor. Okay, which statute did that? Because it's, it certainly contravenes Article 31. It's Article 31 is very clear. It says no person may compel, period. That's it doesn't say no person may compel unless they give trans testimonial immunity or transactional immunity. It just says no person may compel. And a, and a vice admiral giving a lieutenant an order has pretty strong compulsion. That's, do you, do you um, really think testimonial immunity is authorized under the Uniform Code? Mr. Ron, the government does believe that it is. It does believe that the that, that was consistent with the... Uh, uh, president's power for making rules and of course the court-martial and no, it doesn't exist at common law did it no your honor it was uh, generally a statutory created uh, vehicle well if it didn't exist at common law and it's not in the uniform code of military justice how can how can we possibly sanction testimonial immunity well your honor raises an interesting question uh, certainly there is um, authority for it in in the manual uh, the government uh, again uh, would, would argue that that authority uh, was given by Congress and um, the President exercised it uh, okay. in accordance. If, if indeed um, there is no such authority, uh, the government, uh, the, um, Your Honor, raised an interesting question. However, it creates such problems like we had in the Cunningham case and, and uh, this case and 
many, many other cases, Cook v. Orsa, uh, the famous case of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North where the Congress of the United States ordered him to testify. I mean, it's just such a, I'm just wondering uh, if there's no authority in the law to do it. Uh, maybe we ought to just put a stop to that right now. And just, just say the only kind of immunity that's recognized at the common law is transactional immunity, and that's what he had. Your, your Honor uh, does raise an interesting point. As I said, the government um, would, uh, would disagree respectfully on that point, Your Honor. But assume that he did have transactional immunity. How does the government prove that he breached it? Uh, and this, <laughs> this brings back to the, your questions on uh, if there can be any conditions placed on transactional immunity. Uh, certainly, uh, there, there can be conditions placed on transactional immunity. And uh, there, are, there are three different versions here of what the, the uh, petition received in this case. Did he receive testimony immunity? Clearly, under the express language of the document, that is what Admiral Reasons was giving to the petitioner, that the use of his statements could not later be used against him in court martial. Uh, another version is, as Judge Cox pointed out, um, if the accused uh, didn't believe this and relied upon uh, Commander Monaghan, Commander Monaghan had the authority uh, given by Vice Admiral Reason and, and an explicitly approved by Vice Admiral Reason, although the government believes that did not happen. Um, there was a, a, a middle ground here where the, the uh, petitioner believed that he had uh, transaction immunity conditioned on uh, him telling the truth. However, that is not what the government uh, believes happened here because that's not what the military judge found as a finding of fact. And what petitioner tries to avoid is the military judge's findings on the specific issue of Commander Monaghan's statements to the petitioner regarding the grant of testimony immunity that petitioner had in his hand, that petitioner understood after reading and so stated. The judge found that petitioner was afforded the opportunity to read it. After reading it, the petitioner acknowledged that he understood it. And more importantly, the military judge specifically found that um, Regardless of the statements used by Commander Monaghan, Petitioner was not misled by those statements. And what does the judge point to? The military judge says, by his own account, Petitioner was not misled by what Commander Monaghan said. The military judge is obviously referring to testimony in the record. Is there testimony in the record that supports the military judge's findings? Absolutely, Your Honors. Uh, page 221 of the record, this is direct examination now. Um, by petitioner's own defense counsel when asked, what is your understanding? It's my understanding that as long as I tell the truth, whatever I say will not be used against me. Petitioner on page 223 of the record of trial, when asked, uh, what was your, your meeting with Lieutenant Commander Ritter? What happened there? Petitioner said, well, I explained to him what Commander Monaghan told me. And when asked, what did he tell you again if whatever I said could not be used against me? Petitioner was not misled. He understood that he had a testimonial grant of immunity. This was found by the military judge. This is supported by uh, the record in this case. There is also the issue, even if that finding wasn't there, whether Commander Monaghan uh, could grant immunity above what was in the document. As Judge Wish points out, this is not Cook versus Orser. This is not an informal discussion between the staff duty advocate who had the approval of the General Court Martial Convening Authority to enter into um, uh, statements with the petitioner in that case and make promises. Here, there was a specific written grant. Commander Monaghan was explaining it to him. The petitioner must have understood, since it's for the signature of Vice Admiral Reason, that this is the extent of the authority that Commander Monaghan has. It would be unreasonable for him to assume otherwise. Let me ask you a question. Uh, this grant of immunity was given on the 3rd of uh, June? Actually, on the 2nd of June, Your Honor. What? On the 2nd of June, On the 2nd, following the mast. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, did the government suspect uh, uh, Lieutenant Samples, uh, was he a suspect at this time? <clears throat> to answer that question, Your Honor, first of all, the military judge did not make a finding on whether or not um, yeah, well, was What assessed. I'm getting to is uh, he had a, 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 an attorney assigned to him, and here he's given a mast. He uh, goes to see Captain Williams, who tells him, you know, that you know, we're going to get you or, or something like that. 
And then he says, by the way, report over and, you, you know, you're given a use immunity. Where are the lawyers? You know, what are they, I mean, is, you know, where are the lawyers that are supposed to be helping these people who are accused of crime? By Patricia's own testimony, Your Honor, he stated that he had consulted with his counsel um, on the 1st of June. On the 2nd of June, um, he decided to proceed with the mast. He tried to contact his attorney. He could not reach his attorney. Petitioner made the informed decision that I'm willing to proceed without counsel. Yes, but, but when you're interrogating someone under Article 31, uh, you know, you did, were Article 31 rights given to him? But if indeed this was interrogation, it would have had to have been, but, but Commander Monaghan was not interrogating uh, the petitioner in this case. He was explaining a grant of immunity. Right, the, but, the, but he was passed immediately to NIS, Naval mm -hmm. Investigative Service, who interrogated him. But the following... Or asked him questions. The following day, he was uh, interrogated by Defense Criminal Investigative Service. Uh, two points, Your Honor. One, on page 145 of the record, Commander Monaghan said, at the time I gave petitioner immunity, I did not suspect him of committing uh, any offenses. The petitioner had just come from Mass. This Vice is Admiral a guy who was on the third floor of the Tailhook Convention. He's a naval aviator, and he didn't suspect him. Of anything that wasn't disposed of at Mass. Clearly, when okay. Vice Admiral Reason made his determination at Mast, uh, the issue was closed as far as certainly his, his legal counsel well, was counsel, concerned. How do you explain Captain Williams' statement to him then following the Mast? Well, Captain Williams, uh, as I recall, was Commander Monaghan's supervisor? That is correct, Your Honor, and uh, the staff should advocate. Captain Williams did not testify at uh, the trial. Uh, the military well, judge. Where do we get his statement from? Maybe well, I should have asked uh, the fellow. The petitioner attributed those statements to Captain um, Williams. The military judge did not make a finding that Captain Williams made those statements. Uh, therefore, the government would argue that uh, there is it's less than clear whether those statements were specifically made. Certainly, what is clear on the record is that Commander Monaghan stated uh, he was not a suspect in my eyes. And to follow up on your question, uh, Chief Judge, the next day when he met with the uh, DCIS agent, they did not give him his Article 31 rights because they didn't suspect him of committing any offense. They thought that he was there as a, as, as they determined, a lead. We wanted to question him to see if he could lead us to someone else. They did not suspect him of any specific offense, again, that wasn't disposed of already um, at the mast. There is another um, large distinction in this case that didn't exist in this, other, in this court's uh, holdings in Cook, in, um, in Chernovic, and in Kimball. In this case, petitioner had in his hands uh, a written grant of testimony immunity. The government, as, as Judge Cox pointed out, could order him to make a statement and did so order. They gave him an order to cooperate with um, Defense Criminal Investigative Service. This is not a case that existed in Cook, Genovic, and Kimball where the petitioner's right to assert his Fifth Amendment to remain silent he was somehow induced to give up this right by this promise. With this immunity, he did not have that right to give up. He could not be unlawfully induced to do so, as w occurred in, in Cook and um, in Kimball. Now, this unlawful inducement that violates the Fifth Amendment rights of the accused, or of the petitioner argues in this case, this is crucial to a finding of de facto immunity in every case decided by this court on the issue. This is what uh, Judge Fletcher uh, talked about when he said a due process violation. It is this roughshod uh, making a promise, the accused relies on it to his detriment by making incriminating statements and forgoes his right to the Fifth Amendment. This is what not be tolerated and this is for what the extreme drastic remedy of uh, not having the right to prosecute an individual comes from. That did not occur in this case. And further, what did not occur in this case is that the petitioner did not make incriminating statements. This is not a case where the government reaped uh, the fruit of a, a, a promise made by, to the petitioner and obtained incriminating statements that they later used to base uh, the prosecution on. The evidence that the government is using to support the charges of the assault is based on the testimony of Lieutenant Trong, who went to Mass, like Petitioner, who, like Petitioner, was given testimony immunity, 
However, Lieutenant Truong gave a, as found by the military judge, for the first time a full account of what happened. And in that full account, he implicated petitioner in the assault on Julia Rogers. And this was on the 3rd of June? Actually, Your Honor, this occurred on the 4th of June. 4th of June. Um, and it is based on that statement what the military judge specifically found was in no way derived by the statements made by petitioner after he was given the immunity, the testimony grant of immunity. And also, um, this was in, in no way, did they, were they led, was the government led to Lieutenant Truong after the statements? So we have here a case where petitioner Fifth Amendment rights were not violated, where no incriminating statements were made, and petitioner argues that he's entitled to have independent evidence of any of those statements um, not be able to be used in a prosecution. Uh, certainly that is, is not in any way a promise that was made to him or relied upon him at that time. S the petitioner has a burden in this case. The government believes that that burden is that the petitioner has to show that the petitioner was given a, a promise, relied upon and made with the apparent authority of uh, admiral reason that the government not prosecute. Petitioner also has to demonstrate, and the, the standard is by clear indisputable evidence, petitioner has to demonstrate that he relied on this a promise, the fact that he was unable to assert his Fifth Amendment rights, and further, that he made incriminating statements. Petitioner is unable to prove any of those. For that reason, uh, this court should deny the petition and affirm the ruling of the judge below, which is firmly supported by the record. I have, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, the, in the examination by the court of the uh, petitioner, the court says, well, what was your understanding? This is at page 222. What was your understanding when you walked out of the office? What was your understanding of your status at that point insofar as your freedom to discuss whatever information you had concerning the events at Tailhook? Answer, my understanding was through those two pieces of paper, the grant of immunity and the order to testify, that I could say whatever I was asked about Tailhook 91, and as long as I told the truth, I would not be prosecuted or no criminal charges or anything would be brought against me. Yes, sir. Then you get back to the judge's findings or legal conclusions, whatever you want to do. Uh, denote them as, and um, there is a statement, um, let's see, maybe I've lost my place here. At, at any rate, he goes and recites this basic same language, admitting that Commander Monaghan told him that he wouldn't be prosecuted, but yet says that he can find that the accused understood it to be only testimonial immunity. I don't understand how he can make that finding as to what the accused concluded it was. There's a lot of lawyers who could sit and listen to this discussion and wouldn't be able to tell you as they walked out the door what the difference was between transactional and testimonial immunity. Yes, Your Honor. The, uh, the finding that petitioner is, is, in the government's view, basing his whole argument on is found at uh, page 8 of uh, Appell Exhibit um, Exhibit 45, Your Honor, which is the military judge's findings. Uh, and in that finding, um, the military judge said, on explaining the grant of testimony immunity, and, and I'll quote from that, uh, he, meaning Commander Monaghan, explained to the accused that if he would give a complete account of the events in the evening of 7 September 1991, then he would not be pr prosecuted, meaning he petitioner. However, the judge goes on to say, again, that petitioner read the document and understood it. Now, what's very important is uh, at, the, at the lower court, there was a motion for reconsideration made by uh, the Civilian Defense Council. The judge denying that motion read this finding of fact that petition relies upon and then says, but I made a further finding of fact where I elaborated on that, and that's on page 12 of Appellate Exhibit 35. And there, the judge finds that although Commander Monaghan's testimony was somewhat unclear as to the exact words that he used in explaining the nature of the grant of immunity, the accused by his own account was not misled by Commander Monaghan concerning the nature of the immunity. And the accused understood it to be in the context of the written grant of testimony immunity. Now, Your Honor's question is how can the judge make that finding? And that finding is supported in 
the petitioner's testimony in the record at uh, pages 221, 223, and 226. It's also contradicted at page 222. Your Honor correctly points out, and in the government's motion um, to dismiss, the government points out that there is different versions of what the uh, petitioner states. Now, the government concludes one of two things from this. The petitioner is committing perjury when he says, um, it's my understanding that as long as I tell the truth, no matter what I say, will not be used against me. Or, in petitioner's mind, there is no difference between the statement, as long as I tell the truth, no matter what I say, will not be used against me, and as long as I tell the truth, I will not be prosecuted. In the petitioner's mind, they're one and the same thing because they relate to the testimony of grant of immunity. One leaves some verbiage out that he doesn't feel is important but is implied, and the other is clearly uh, stated on the record as a testimony grant of immunity. Therefore, the, the court's findings below are fully supported. Now, I, I guess I have some of the same questions that have been uh, articulated by the chief judge. You've got a three-star ordering a lieutenant to say what, uh, to totally cooperate, and testify to everything he knows about this, and a uh, confusing uh, to him, obviously, from the way he answered the questions, grant of immunity and no lawyers in sight to represent him. Uh, that's a little bothersome to me. Your Honor, the petitioner made the statement to go forward without counsel. Uh, Commander Monaghan was questioned on the record as what was his recollection if he, in, if he asked the accused about counsel. Commander Monaghan said that it would have been of importance to him that the counsel wasn't there and he would have inquired into that, although he did not specifically remember asking the petitioner about that. But it's, in, it's important, Your Honor, that even even if you were disturbed about the, the, uh, the conversation between Commander Monaghan and the petitioner about immunity, is look what happened afterwards. Th there was just no detrimental reliance by the petitioner. And without detrimental reliance, this court has never found that there is a grant of de facto transaction immunity. That is key. That is what this court said in Kimball when it says whether or not uh, it's 704 immunity, whether or not it's a criminating statement, or whether or not the accused somehow relied on his detriment. I, I think you made a very important point early in your argument, and, and looking at that case and these various cases, let's look at the facts of Kim. Yes, sir. Uh, there, the special court martial convening authority told Sergeant Kimball, if you go downtown and cooperate with the child abuse people and get your life squared away, we will not court martial you. In reliance on that, he goes downtown and gets his life squared away. And the next court martial convening authority that replaces the one that made him the promise says, the heck with that, I'm going to prosecute him. And a majority of the court found de facto immunity. That's correct, Your Honor. I said something different, but I gave him relief anyway because I thought he had violated his Article 31 rights. Uh, what we've got here, though, is none of that. As I understand your argument, let's assume, like I did earlier, that Admiral Reason gave him transactional immunity in Condition. writing. And the condition was that was you have to cooperate and tell the truth. Right. That's what Sample understood. Yes, sir. I will not be prosecuted if I cooperate and tell the truth. Now, the government is contending in trial, too, that he is lying when he said he didn't assault Julie Rogers. They're, they're contending that by accusing him of having assaulted her. Now, my question, I, you know, I, I realize this is a complicated area of constitutional due process, but to me, how does the government enforce a simple agreement, a simple condition? We're going to give you immunity if you cooperate. He didn't cooperate, according to the government. What do they do about it? I think this is a real simple case. And if, if, he's, if, if he's acquitted, you know, it proves he cooperated. If he's convicted, it proved he didn't. And, and I, mean, if, I, I don't, uh, he hadn't given any statements or any evidence that they're using against him that I can see. He hadn't done anything in reliance on that promise. And, and no it, consideration. Yes, Your Honor, and, and, <laughs> and the government, the government obviously uh, agrees with that. If um, there was no testimony immunity, uh, or if the testimony immunity was not turned into facto immunity, even if it was, as you point out, uh, but, but in Cook v. Orsa, for example, uh, General Teagarten said, look, we're trying to get to the bottom of damage control. You tell us how much you gave the Russians, and we won't prosecute you. And he said, okay, sir, and, gave, and told him. Then they prosecuted him, just like Kimball. Yes, sir. Just like Cunningham, to a certain degree. 
and but not on the facts in this case. Yeah, that's right. correct. Your this honor. case is a, a new one, a new wrinkle. And the government would, would agree with, with the judge's analysis if indeed there was a finding of, of tr conditional transaction immunity. Okay. Counsel, uh, as I understand it, the defense also argues alternatively that if it was transactional uh, or testi testimonial immunity, that uh, derivative use was made of it. How do you respond to that? Oh, the, the response to that, Your Honor, is the military judge specifically found that there was no derivative use. Um, those findings are clearly supported on the record. Uh, the evidence that is supporting the underlying charge comes from Lieutenant Trong, this, which was in no way derived by the petitioner's statements. Uh, petitioner does not even argue that at this point, uh, since it's clear uh, that the military judge was correct in that ruling. There was no derivative use. Obviously, if there was derivative use, the government would be prohibited from using that. Uh, that is not the case here. What, what derivative use is being argued by the uh, defense? Or are they arguing a derivative use? Am I uh, wrong, uh, in, wrong about that? At, at the motion uh, below, there was two, two prongs um, pursued. One was the de facto immunity, the other was derivative use. Mm -hmm. The military judge obviously found no de facto immunity and also found no derivative use. Uh, in bringing this petition to the court, the petitioner does not argue the derivative use argument, which the government believes implies that he, it's being conceded based on the judge's, the clearly correct judge's findings, which are supported on the record. All right, I think we understand the government's position. There's no further questions from the bench. And we'll now hear rebuttal. Thank you. Your others, I, 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 I think. Just in case you, you know, I'm with you, I think, on the question of the transactional immunity. Right, Your Honor. I, want, I want somebody to tell me, what do you do? And when this, you give somebody transactional immunity and they snub their nose at you. I, I can answer that, Your Honor. Uh, for one thing, the <laughs> petitioner in this case didn't snub his nose. Well, according to the government, he did. Well, but, no, wait. The government wants to have its cake, and then they want to eat it. And that's not permissible. It says in the grant of immunity, and I can uh, direct my, my, my question to your honor. It says specifically in samples is immunity. In consideration of your testimony as a witness for the government in the matters described in enclosure one, you are granted immunity from the use of your testimony. Now, what happened after the fact is Commander Monahan, in explaining this document, then went beyond it and said, we're going to give you de facto immunity. We're going to, by, by his apparent authority, said, we're not going to prosecute you if you cooperate with us. And what happens then? We continue on. You are given immunity against you in any criminal case except the prosecution for perjury giving a false statement under the provisions of this grant of immunity or otherwise failing to comply with an order to testify. And if the petitioner has done that, the government can bring him to court-martial for perjury, giving a false statement, or otherwise failing to comply with an order to testify. And that hasn't been the case today. That's what the government can do. And the government can do that they haven't done that. They're trying to renege on their promise. And they can't do that. Counsel, under the um, rationale of Cunningham, would I be correct in stating that in order to grant extraordinary relief, which you are seeking in this case, that we would have to find that it's abundantly clear that any verdict of guilty would be overturned on appeal? I, I think in, in regards, and I'd address them to Chief Judge Sullivan's questions, as far as fundamental fairness in several different uh, proceedings where if, if, if fundamental fairness and the government in Cunningham conceded, as you correctly noted in your concurring opinion, if that, if the end result would be different, of course, that is a correct. Th this case is before this court on extraordinary relief as it was in Cook v. Orser. The conclusion <coughs> is, yes, we have a prima facie writ case here. If we find that there is no, that, that immunity transactional immunity was given, then that's, that's where, th then you, your, your client has, uh, cannot that's, be tried. That's correct. He, he can't be tried for perjury, false statement, or 
an order's violation for failing to show up. The, the government in its uh, pleadings or, or in its representations today say, well, he didn't have any, thir or he didn't uh, have, he did not have to be advised of his 31B rights because he wasn't a suspect. Throw that red herring out right now. That is not supported by the record. Captain Williams, his, the, the, the force judge advocate sat there and told him, no, you're guilty of that. And then they lead him down and they say, Commander Monaghan says, here is a, t a grant of immunity. Here it is. And you know what? We're not going to prosecute you as long as you're truthful. Well, that's what it says here, except we're not going to use it. What he was saying is we're not going to prosecute you. That's transactional de facto grant of immunity. It's a representation by the force judge advocate, the assistant force judge advocate in this case, who admits and concedes on the record that he was the individual who was giving immunity. He was the one that was initialing it. And now he's the one that's handing it to the accused and saying, and saying to him, we're not going to prosecute you if you're truthful with us, if you cooperate with us. Well, that's what this says, except it says prosecution. Now, the burden in this case rests upon the government. Je Commander Monaghan made representations which are, which are not, uh, which are coy and unresponsive. They are representations which lead to confusion. And in this case, an accused need not determine and question the integrity of the superiors who are in charge and who have an affirmative duty, as this court said in Cook v. Orser, to make sure that they use precise language. The today, the government misreads Cook to you. They specifically say that the convening authority allowed for the SJ in that case to make those representations representations. That's not supported by the record. And with that, we'd ask that this court find transactional grant of immunity and order that the charges be dismissed. Counsel, speaking of the record, where in the record is there evidence of Captain Williams' statement to the accused? It's stated if, if you in, know. If not, the, I'll find it. in the petitioner's uh, uh, testimony on the record. I believe it's uh, at page 220 in the record. Thank you. All right, if there's no further questions, um, that completes the argument. The uh, case, I believe, has been well argued and well briefed, and uh, the court will issue an opinion in due course. Uh, the court stay uh, that was issued uh, some 10 days ago remains in effect. Uh, the, uh, the, your client cannot be tried by a court martial until further order of this court, which would either lift the stay or by some other means uh, dispose of the case. Are there any questions from the parties? All right. Uh, any further things from the court? Uh, this uh, court now will uh, stand adjourned. Uh, I will, before we adjourn, I will note that uh, I ask counsel to remain in the well pursuant to our custom of welcoming counsel to the, uh, this court's proceedings and that this, uh, this, I believe, is the fifth time this court has been televised. Uh, um, the judges of this court waived the, uh, the rule against cameras in the courtroom as part of our project outreach, whereby uh, our court uh, lets itself, on occasion, uh, on uh, cases, uh, be seen by the, the public to, to uh, underscore the, uh, the type of, of uh, justice that is given and practice in the military service. Court stands adjourned. The U.S. Court of Military Appeals, the nation's highest military court, is expected to rule on the immunity of Lieutenant Samples in the near future. Coming up next is a forum on the future of television, sponsored by Broadcasting and Cable Magazine.
On Monday, the C-SPAN school bus visited Antietam National Battlefield.